We're at my cousin's ranch in Nevada and we're experiencing the cowboy life for just a couple of days. Hey girls, what time is it? Yeah! Let's go! We're going to be stopping in Salt Lake along the way to pick up something. We'll take you along for the ride. The drive to Salt Lake City to run a quick errand was 36 minutes of driving to go 33 miles, which used 14% of our battery or 11 kilowatt hours. We then continued on to Wendover, which was 1 hour and 43 minutes to go 126 miles using 62% of our battery or 48 kilowatt hours. We've arrived at the Wendover supercharger. What did you think of the drive, girls? Good? Yeah! yeah. Clara slept most of the way, huh? <laughs> We uh, went to Arby's on the way here to get some food, and we're now charging, and we'll eat while we're charging. Uh, we're, it looks like we just barely got over 100 kilowatts, and then it's dropping quickly. So uh, we arrived with 23%. That's after the tangent going over to Arby's. So we'll be here for a little bit. I've navigated us to our destination, which is London, Nevada, right here, and the car is estimating a 40 minute charge time before we leave. So we'll get eaten, and we'll, well, the part, it's been about 90 degrees this whole time. Hey Lucy, show me your earrings. Did you just get those? Oh wow, they look great. This is kind of funny. If you look here on the ground, there's a whole lot of salt from the salt flats that has tracked over here to the superchargers uh, from people driving on the salt flats nearby. Hey girls, let's see how the charging is going. All right, we're at a 50% and uh, 57 kilowatts, and it's estimating <clears throat> that we would arrive with negative 14%, and we'll wait until that's quite a bit higher uh, because we're going out into the middle of nowhere. And it's also uh, saying that it thinks we need to wait 25 more minutes. This supercharger location is an example of where sometimes the signs say 30 minute general parking and sometimes they just say electric vehicle parking. So every other stall here is dedicated to electric vehicles and every other one is 30 minute general parking. It's kind of interesting how they're doing that. We're almost done charging, everyone's done eating. I don't know how well you can see on this camera, but off in the distance there is a dark ridge of mountains. It starts off over here to the right and goes that way. And we're going to be going straight down a road right there and we'll be crossing over that black ridge of mountains straight down that way. We are now at 84% battery and it would take another half an hour to get up to 100% but we're not going to do that. We have taken on 46 kilowatt hours and we're down to 27% uh, um, 27 kilowatt charge rate. Uh, it's estimating that we will arrive in uh, Lund, Nevada at 17% and it's going to take us nearly two and a half hours to do that. And looking at the map here, you can see it's quite just a lot of desolate desert out here with uh, little towns along the way. And so we're giving ourselves extra charge margin than we normally would just in case. So we're gonna now get unplugged and we'll get on our way. Are you girls ready to go? We charged in Wendover for 54 minutes, adding 62% to our battery or 45.98 kilowatt hours. Tesla's price per kilowatt hour was 26 cents and they have listed that we used 50 kilowatt hours. That means this supercharge would have cost us $13 if we didn't have free supercharging. Teslafy reports two numbers. One is the amount used from the supercharger, the other is the amount put into the battery. The difference is what the vehicle used while charging, such as for the heater or air conditioning. Tesla Tesla's number is an even 50 kilowatt hours, and Teslafy reports that we used 46.8 kilowatt hours from the supercharger, so I'm not sure why there's a discrepancy there. We then drove to our destination 157 miles away, which took 2 hours and 17 minutes and used 72% of our battery, or 57 kilowatt hours. We arrived there with 12% remaining. I charged the car at our relative's house where we were staying and they declined letting us pay for the electricity. The charge from 12 to 90% used 64.8 kilowatt hours and took six hours and 46 minutes, finishing at 3.17 a.m. The entire drive from our home to London, Nevada was 316 miles and used 116 kilowatt hours. The supercharger was $13 and the home charging would have been $6.92 at $0.10 cents per kilowatt hour 
for a grand total of $19.92 to drive 316 miles out there. We just drove through some pretty mountainous terrain. You can see the uh, pent energy consumption uh, was quite high. Uh, I slowed down a little bit. It's now estimating arriving at 5%, so we'll go ahead and give us some time to recover that estimate and then I'll speed back up. I uh, slowed down for a bit and the energy consumption reduced and now it has us arriving at 13%, which is much better. We'll just keep going along at this rate and we should be fine. All right, we've arrived at 12% uh, battery. It's 68 degrees here and can't really see anything because it's totally dark. <laughs> uh, this is what our consumption looked like over the last 30 miles. I just wanted to show you uh, what we set up for charging here at our uh, relative's house where we're staying here. You'll see that we're charging at uh, 40 amps or uh, 9 kilowatts. We arrived here with 12% and we're now up to 39% and it is nearly 11 p.m. and we had arrived at just after 8 p.m. So let me show you the charging here, the setup we have. So as usual we have the car plugged in right here and I could have backed in but I didn't bother to and this is the Tesla mobile connector there. And then we have my NEMA 1450 30 foot extension cord going up here to a NEMA 1450 outlet. So they have that wired up for us, so it works great. And we're able to charge up completely overnight, no problem. This morning is the morning of the cattle drive, and so I've come along to check it out. This is where we're going to be going, is up over those mountains in the distance, and the sun is just rising. They had two cattle drives scheduled this week. Today's cattle drive was herding the cattle 17 miles through a canyon into some mountainside grazing land for the fall grass growing season. I didn't feel like attempting to ride a horse for 17 miles, so I decided to participate in the second drive instead which was 10 miles to a different pasture in the same valley. For this longer drive, I followed along in my Tesla and captured what I could. As the horsemen and women rode across a couple pastures to get to where the cattle were waiting, the cattle looked like they knew what was about to go down. The cattle are taken to graze up in the mountains every spring and fall. They're brought back to the valley during winter because they die in the snow and it's too far away to easily supplement their feed with hay up there. They're also brought back to the valley in the summer because the mountain area is too dry to support their feeding exclusively. As the cattle leave the corral, they tend to try going in different directions, so they constantly have to be herded in the right direction. This drive occurred in September after a long, hot, and dry summer, so the dust was super thick on the road. I guess a potential positive spin on that would be that it looks epic with the huge cloud of dust blowing behind this large herd of cattle. They also had one dog that was doing a great job at also helping to herd the cattle and sometimes he'd jump over fences or run ahead to block an entrance so that they would stay on the road. Along the way, many cattle constantly tried to grab a tasty morsel along the road, so they constantly have to be coaxed along. Given the opportunity, they will all just fan out and just sit there and graze on the side of the road and then just wander along, finding whatever they can eat. Some of them don't want to leave and they manage to get away, so a horseman has to chase them down and bring them back to the herd. This is a good example of on the route where they got into a large open area without any fences to contain the cattle and they had to uh, run back and forth a lot to keep those cattle grouped together and keep them motivated to uh, go across the whole valley to the canyon entrance. So we followed the cattle as far as we could on the gravel road and then they started off, off across a field. So I um, continued taking a gravel road up here to the canyon entrance which is where they are coming to. And I'm just going to explore a little bit and wait for them to get here. The Model S is super dusty, which is to be expected after such a hot and dry summer and also just driving on gravel roads in general. The road to the canyon entrance is a gentle slope up and here where I am it's elevated enough to give a beautiful view of the valley. I hoped I parked far enough away from the road to give the cattle plenty of room to pass by. I drove here way faster than the cattle walk, so when I arrived they were still just a cloud of dust in the distance. That gave me plenty of time to explore the area. You probably can't see the cattle, but the plume of dust in the center is them. I technically could have continued driving up the road a ways after the cattle passed me by, but I decided this was a good stopping point, and the road gets narrow and bumpy farther up. So right here is where I parked the Model S at the canyon entrance, and then down this road is where I came, and way off in the distance down that way, you can mostly see it because of the, the dust, is where the cattle are being driven up here. I'm doing a cool time-lapse here with the Osmo Pocket 
uh, mounted here on the Tesla. So that'll be interesting to see how that turns out. As the cattle arrived at my parking lot, they tried to take advantage of the wide area to fan out, and the horsemen had to work extra hard to herd them into the canyon entrance. The cattle were certainly resisting going up the canyon, and at this point the herd had broken into two groups. It doesn't make sense to try to get cattle to go much faster, because that tends to just break the herd up. So the forward group was allowed to hang out while the back group caught up. Personally, I find it fascinating watching the movements of the herd, especially like this sped up five times, because in real time this is very slow going. Finally, they managed to merge the two herds into one, but now they were happily chilling in my parking lot and resisting going into the canyon entrance. After a lot of coaxing, yelling, running, and threatening, some of the cattle finally began to go up the road, but still others resisted. Many of these cows had just had their spring calves weaned from them back at the ranch, so that explains a lot of the resistance too. I give them credit for not wanting to easily leave their young behind. Once they finally got the herd to fan out up the narrow road, it was a beautiful, yet dusty still, sight to see. The difficulties of this configuration is that the cattle along the front half of the column can no longer see or hear any motivation to keep going, so they slow down creating a traffic jam behind them. Then they notice more tasty morsels along the side of the road, and yet again they begin to fan out off the road. Did I mention this was slow going? Even the horses were getting frustrated. Well, that's not entirely true. It was just the quadcopter the horse didn't care for. While I was looking on, feeling somewhat helpless to be able to help, I realized if the horse noticed the quadcopter, then maybe the cattle would too. So I flew down to try my hand at quadcopter cattle herding. I think I was about to be successful, but my attempt was foiled by the real cowboys swooping in. However, I got my break just a couple minutes later when I saw behind me a group of cows had managed to get past the horsemen. I was able to fly my quadcopter much faster than the horses, and I lowered it right into the path of the first cow, and lo and behold it worked. I mean, it at least stopped the cows in their tracks. They weren't exactly reversing course. I held them at bay until a horseman showed up to drive them back. I asked them if they ever used ATVs to herd the cattle, and they said yes, they've tried, but cattle can be agile when they want to be, and the terrain is pretty rough in places, and riding horseback still can't be beat. Plus, the horses are also on board with what's going on, and they are great at being even more agile and faster than the cattle. I saw them riding over some very steep terrain, so I saw firsthand what they were talking about. They do, however, have a fleet of around 7 ATVs that they use for transportation, maintenance, and doing things all over the ranch. Some of them are dedicated to specific tasks because they are outfitted with specialized tools. For example, one of them was just for fence maintenance. Finally, the last of the rebellious cattle were back on the road, and eventually all I could see was dust up ahead in the canyon. There in the distance where the dust plume is, is the last of the cattle being driven up into the canyon. That was pretty fun to be able to see, uh, at least for me it was. I hope it was fun for you to be able to see that, and uh, I'll keep showing you some of the other adventures that we're going to be having here at the ranch. The terrain here is a little bit on the rough side. So down here on the MCU, I've changed the suspension to very high, which according to this gives me 6.9 inches of clearance, which is plenty sufficient for these rocks on the road. So the cattle uh, finished going by and now I'm going to be going back down this road and uh, dodge the cow patties along the way. I certainly tried to dodge them, but I wasn't entirely successful. I abandoned even trying when I was driving and flying the quadcopter at the same time, and this was the consequence. By the way, did I mention the dust was crazy thick on these roads? I drove back to the ranch where we then got ready for swimming and headed to the local watering hole. Like this is the actual spring for the town's irrigation. Are you going to go swimming in the spring? Considering the dry desert all around, it's a welcome sight and the water is super clear and cold. After playing in the water for a while, we headed back to the ranch where the kids continued playing with the water on a slip and slide as well as the old classic sprinkler on a trampoline. Then they would alternate between that and laying in the sun to warm up. I tried to help dry them off faster, but they didn't appreciate the cold wind. 
The next day was time for our chance to ride horses. This was the second cattle drive I mentioned earlier, where they needed to relocate a herd of cattle 10 miles away to a new pasture in the valley. I've only had the opportunity to ride horses a couple of times in my life, and my girls never have had the chance, so we were all excited to do it. We headed down to the tack shack where they store all the saddles and other horse equipment, and they saddled up the horses. Lucy, what? where are you? On a horse. You are? Is that exciting? Where are we going? We're going to go get some cattle. Off in the distance there in the center is the cattle we're going to round up. Dad, the dog is coming. Yeah. Where? Yeah. Well, we rounded up all these cattle. What do you think, Lucy, so far? It was great. It was great? Yeah. You having tons of fun? The cattle, like, like the cattle over here will go past. Yeah, that's a good idea. But we'll have it go right over here in this opening, okay? okay? You don't need to keep pulling. Just watch and see where it goes and then coax it when it needs to coax it. Mom and Lydia and Clara are in the, tra the suburban over there. What's your favorite part about riding a horse, Lucy? Um, riding it. <laughs> Just being on a horse. Can you say, I'm on a horse. I'm on a horse. More enthusiastic. I'm on a horse. <laughs> there you go. It's gonna go over in the green. There's a fence there. Wait, oh, There's I didn't see There's just little see wires. It. I couldn't see the fence. Mm -hmm. It's rather difficult to launch a quadcopter from the saddle, and as we saw earlier, the horses don't like it. So I dismounted and walked for a moment to get it aloft. After jogging to catch up with our horse, I managed to remount the horse with the controller in one hand. Then I managed to get Lucy back up with me. It wasn't pretty, but we managed. This grate in the road is a cattle guard, which stops the cattle from going past that point since they can't walk on the widely spaced metal bars. This is obviously a good thing when you're trying to keep the cattle in, but in our case we're trying to get them past, so we opened up a gate next to it so they could get through. And Lucy is doing a great job leading the horse. Clara, what do you think of being on a horse? Fun. Fun. We're uh, still cruising along, guiding the cattle along this road. The girls took turns riding with me, and there was plenty of time to ride as we were doing this for a good chunk of the day. Unfortunately, at this point in time, we were downwind from the cattle, so we had lots of dust all over us. Clara, yeah. what is your favorite part about riding a horse? Fun. It's fun? We started the cattle drive at 10.03 a.m., and we arrived at the destination at 3.09 p.m., so it took a total of five hours. We had a truck pulling a horse trailer after us, acting as the support vehicle for the younger kids when they weren't riding with us, and also for when we arrived at the destination so we could drive back home more quickly. Also, Jessica and I were sharing riding on one of the horses, so we took turns driving in the vehicle. At this point, nobody had gone ahead yet to open the fence next to the cattle guard, so the cattle couldn't proceed until someone rode up to the front and opened that gate, at which point the cattle happily poured through. As you can see, this is a much more docile cattle drive compared to the day before, especially compared to the chaotic canyon entrance yesterday. This is just a long slog on flat terrain in the valley, so easier but not as interesting. Just slowly riding along on relatively quiet horses did provide a lot of time for some good conversations though. We are now at a watering hole. We have a windmill up here and the cattle are resting up and I'm going to let my horse get a drink. We've now been riding for 8.1 miles and we have been riding for about four and a half hours and we're almost there. I don't know if you, how well you can see it, but way off in the distance, right there in the middle of the screen, is a tree, a dark green tree sticking up, and that's about where we're going. They are thirsty horses. We're now away from any of the gravel roads that we were following before, and we are just out in the open desert prairie, I'll call it. I don't really know what this is technically. And we're still just driving the cattle forward. The cattle are really tired at this point. Luckily, they did just get a watering break, so that's good. Up ahead of us is where we're taking them to, so we're almost to the end of destination, and this is going to be their feeding grounds in this general area.
Yep, just hours and hours of this right here in the perspective of the saddle. Just bouncing around on the back of the horse, chasing cattle. It's really hot. It's about 98 degrees right now. Let's talk about mobility for a second. So I'm riding a horse right now, which is what people did for millennia before the internal combustion engine and then now electric vehicles are coming along. Let's just say the transportation has come a long way, especially if you think of this like a road trip. I've been out on the road now for about five hours on this horse. And let's just say that I hurt a lot more than I do when I'm driving for five hours in my Tesla or any other car for that matter, but especially the Tesla. I feel like I've driven 12 hours or 14 hour days in the Tesla right now. <laughs> Let's just say I'm really happy to be living in the age that I am and that I don't have to only ride horses all the time. <laughs> but that being said, being able to ride horses right now is super fun because we don't get to do this very often. And it's a really fun experience to have occasionally for sure. And not just for recreation, but like legitimate business purposes, driving these cattle to new feeding grounds is an important part of ranching and it's fun to be able to participate in that. Here's the big man in charge of this ranch <laughs> on his cell phone. <laughs> so in this case, this is a place where you can text and drive just fine. You have a fully autonomous vehicle here. Fully autonomous. This is Jake, and he is the, what would you call yourself of this ranch? Owner operator. I'll call you the head honcho. Uh, head honcho? Head honcho sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> How many cattle do you have? Oh, about a thousand head. Cool. And we're almost there. That's the windmill in the distance right there that we're taking them to. When did we start? I think it was around 8.30. 8.30. Maybe 8.45, and it's currently probably like 1.30. Good one. Good ride. How long was yesterday? No. Yesterday, yesterday was what? 6 a.m. to... To 4. 4? I think it's 10 hours. 10 hours. Straight <laughs> riding. Wow. Down, down the mountain. It's a good thing you're accustomed to this. <laughs> Mostly. Mostly. You, you, you get sore too. <laughs> There's no way to get away from Yeah, fair enough. One right after another, all the way down there. Yeah, perfect single file. Nice, clear Nevada day. Nice. You don't have to worry about having your party rained out. That's yeah, that's for sure. So you're going to open this gate and then reclose it so they don't go in immediately? Yeah. Okay. Because i got to shut some other gates. I don't want to go to that other pasture. I want to go to this pasture. Gotcha. All right, we've arrived. This is one of many wells they have here on the ranch, and this one well provides water to several different pastures, which are separated by fences in a hub-spoke pattern so that they can control better the grazing of the cattle in different areas. And just like that, the cattle are back at their new feeding grounds. So this is old technology, but it is like a solar panel. It, it pumps about 15 to 20 gallons a minute to keep up with the cows. They're extremely expensive because of the amount of labor and time to build it. So with the technology today though, it's all solar. We can now put a solar panel in here for half the cost of this and pump twice the amount of water. Wow, that's really good. That's really good. And so this year, we have about six wells through this valley that are not on solar yet, and we are going to do a mass solar upgrade on everything through the valley. Mm -hmm. And even with wind, it's it's probably the least efficient energy we have is wind. Hmm. And because the wind hasn't blown hardly all day today. Well, and to your point, it doesn't pump when it's not windy enough, obviously, but if it's too windy, it then it also doesn't pump. It has some uh, the the blades up there it looks like they have some louvers on them and they're probably spring loaded i'm guessing yeah, they, they just shuts. they flatten out the spring load shuts if it's too windy That's right. and so they're limited in, in their abilities so more than 15, solar yeah oh yeah 10 way more 20 is like all all handle 10 to 20 mile an hour wind mm -hmm. and and then to back that up we use pump so we start this pump mm -hmm. but you still have to check it almost every single day Oh wow! So you have to come all the way out here every day. Just about, yeah. Just to make sure. Yeah. Make sure it's working. Blowing. But with solar, 
our phones can talk to the solar units. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Uh, and we can we know what it's doing when it's pumping, and it pretty much just takes care of itself. So the cattle, we can put them here. We when we need to check them, but they can be two to three days, and we know they have water when mm -hmm. they have solar. Right. Because the sun shines 364 days a year in Nevada, <laughs> and we always yep. have sun. Right. Right. So it is now. It's it's gone from unreliable but you needed something to unreliable but you needed something more mm -hmm. to now solar which is very reliable and you don't have to babysit it right it runs on and board. and regarding this uh, pump here it's i assume gasoline powered yes and so every time you come out you bring gas and make sure it's topped up or mm -hmm. something so not only do you spend the fuel to get here you spend the fuel in it and then i mean they're pretty efficient pumps you can run them at a low idle mm -hmm. and they pump a lot of water because water is only six feet deep here oh wow yeah so but with solar, we're going to be pumping 30 to 35 gallons a minute. Mm-hmm. Wow. Lots of water. And then this, obviously, is all for this watering tank here, which the cattle drink from, just for additional context there. Remind me what the tank is for. So this is the bank water. So, so it's like the battery in a solar system. Yep. If you have wind on one day, but not on the other day, at least you can bank that water, hold the water in this tank, and then we float it out into the actual trough for the cattle to drink at a certain and, level so there's no waste of water. And when you say float, you basically mean that there's a float here, like a toilet bowl float right there, and that automatically lets water in or out depending on the height of the water. That's right. This is what they call a ball float. A ball float, yep. So as that drops, water comes. Oh, yeah, cool. I can hear it. So we don't waste water. There's, there's not enough of it in Nevada, so we gotta... <laughs> gotta conserve. Yeah. That's really interesting to hear how solar is now economically the best solution. Oh, yeah, like by, by a lot. By far. Less than half the cost the, of that. The, the cost is though that you already have uh, sunk costs, right? I do. And it's like, you, it's a tech debt or technology debt. And so now you've already got something that's here. Someone spent the money in the past. You kind of though want to replace it because it just doesn't perform very well. So eventually you can justify the cost that this is just not worth it anymore to maintain. Here's the neat thing too, with solar, I can leave this. So it kind of has this nostalgic feel to it. it yeah that's true so i can leave this and put my motor on the bottom of this mm -hmm. and still keep it i can keep all this it just won't do anything no it'll still do something oh so when the sun's not shining but at night time the wind is blowing hard to say storm's coming in oh. a good wind this will pump all night long hmm. interesting point it runs all day and you can bank as much water as you want i can still use yeah. this tank with the solar and then with uh, the internet connected solar uh, you can know that there's water levels here. Like, would you have a device that actually tells you the actual water so that's level? That's a separate device from the solar. Ah. Can, there's a device that you can put on the edge of your tank, mm -hmm. and it will tell you the depth of your tank of water. So you would potentially never need to come out here. Potentially, just to check your cows. And, and the cat, well, you should probably just check on your cattle, yeah. Uh, but also, like, this moss isn't a concern. Like, they drink right through the moss, right? Yeah, they'll pick it out and drink through it. It yeah. keeps the water cool. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so that makes sense. This collects the heat, and that keeps the water cool. So it's not a bad thing. Not to the cattle. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Upon returning to their house all hot and dusty, we had the good fortune of finding their irrigation rotation was running in the ditch just outside their yard. The kids had a ton of fun floating down the irrigation ditch repeatedly. Since the water is straight from underground, it is quite cold, but that didn't phase them. It was a little too cold for my taste, but I had a lot of fun riding four-wheelers. I'm on a four-wheeler right now. And it's lots of fun. I can't wait until four wheelers are electric because I totally want one and it will be silent. At least it won't have the puttering of the motor behind it anyway. But four wheelers are tons of fun. We have come to a neighborhood pizza get together afternoon on a Saturday. And you can see everyone showing up with their trucks mostly. There is this red sedan there. And you have all these SUVs and trucks and then a jeep suburban and then you have a tesla here <laughs> it's so dusty these roads really are incredible right now they've had a very hot dry summer here in nevada and there's just like an inch of powder on top of all the roads we're uh, cruising back to their house and it is 101 degrees outside and it was 102 just a minute ago. We're on four wheelers! A couple of us then went on an evening four wheeler ride up to a lookout point for a good view of the sunset. The black on the ground is a burn scar from a wildfire a year prior. 
We're right four wheelers up to L Hill. We'll show you what the view looks like when we get to the top. So far, it's pretty awesome. Oh yeah, look at this. Oh, that's awesome. It looks like Mordor. In the uh, Lord of the Rings, you know. Yes, that board. Lucy's gonna ride the one wheel. That I'm getting better. You are getting way better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like we got a slow leak in the tire. I can't say that I'm surprised. Alright, so it looks like this is yep. We found the hole. You can see the water had blown out when we put the water on it. So we got a hole right there in our tire. For some reason. Don't really I don't see a nail. It looks like it was probably broken glass because it's kind of a slot that went through. And so I'm gonna try using my tire patch kit and we'll see how it goes. Okay, so I've, as I've shown you in the past, I have a tire patch kit in my front. So let's get that out. Here it is. This is my tire patch kit. So here's what's in the tire patch kit. There's some instructions, whatever. Uh, these are the actual patches. So each one of these would be for a hole in a tire. Hopefully we don't need to <laughs> use all these. That's uh, quite a few. And then uh, here we have a, a bit of a rasp thing that you that will be pushing in that hole to clear it out. And then this is the tool to actually push the patch into the hole. Okay, so now I'm going to push in this rough tool. There we go. You can hear the air coming out even more now. There was some pent up pressure in there. It feels a little wrong to be pushing a hole into my tire. <laughs> Okay, so that's good. Okay, so then we'll push this plug in. There we go. Okay, so now I've pulled this out. You can see it's got some goop on there still, and that's the plug remaining, and I cut the tips off so it's mostly flush with the tread. And just with driving, it'll get evened out. So now I'm gonna air up the tire and see if it's sealed it off successfully. All right, I'm driving for a bit, and I was checking to see what the TPMS would say, and you can see it shows 51 PSI right here. And I left that just a little on the high side because I wanted to give it a chance to maybe leak anything. So I'm just going to uh, leave it how it is now with 51 PSI and we'll drive home today and we'll see if it loses any air. We are about to take off. I'm just getting the car ready. Looking at the charging of it, you can see the battery is at 100%. Uh, it hasn't quite finished charging so it's still working on it but it's pretty much there. It's down to 10 amps of pull. If I switch over to the display settings, and look at distance, we can come over here and we can see 255 miles of rated range and 102 degrees in here in the garage where we are. So I'll switch this back to energy because I prefer that. After several days of hanging out, having fun, visiting, and helping around the ranch, it was time to drive home. We said our goodbyes and began the drive through the fields and gravel roads back home. We're on the road, we're heading back home. It's been a really fun trip and I think we've all had a ton of fun. Have you had a ton of fun? Yeah, good. We got to make some fun memories with our cousins. And now two of the three are already sleeping. <laughs> All right, looking at the, the terrain here, you can see it's still just open desert. Uh, this is the route we're taking. Uh, we're gonna be hitting Wendover again, the supercharger there on the way home. Uh, it's estimating that we'll arrive with 31% at Wendover. And this is our energy for the last little bit. I'm gonna switch over here to trip and that's what the uh, trip graph is estimating for this route. And so we're uh, currently at 92% battery and 98 degrees Fahrenheit. There is Whoa. another 11 miles remaining before we get to Wendover. And this is what the energy has been looking like over the last 30 miles. Look at this view. This is a really hazy time right now, probably from the fires in California. And straight ahead there is Wendover across this giant valley. And you can probably barely see it because of all the haze. 
Um, but the uh, the mountains in this area are pretty cool looking. Like you can see this one over here close by. It's just a really desolate region of the world for sure. All right, we've plugged in. It peaked up in the high 90s and we had arrived at 25% and now it's gone down to 90 kilowatts. It's estimating an hour and five minutes to get to 100%, but we're only going to charge enough to get home. So now I've routed us to near our home up here and it's estimating that we need 40 minutes of charging to uh, to get home and so we'll see how long it is we usually only just charge long enough to uh, get home with 10% remaining so we'll be here for about 40 minutes probably maybe slightly less uh, but in the meantime we picked up some dinner and we'll be eating that while we wait look at our poor dirty car it's definitely not a normal vehicle for a ranch but it got us there and got us around at the ranch and performed great Girls, how's your dinner? Good. Glad to hear it. How's your dinner, Lydia? Great. Right. Are you enjoying your dinner? Did you find a great seat? Yeah. Looking over here at the tire that I patched, that mark right there is where it was. Well, it still is. And if you look right there, you can see the patch. So it's uh, still holding just fine. We haven't lost any air at all over the last couple of hours of driving. Did you have a good break? Yeah. Did you have a good dinner? Yeah. Yeah? Lydia, can you turn on your light overhead? There you go. You have some fruit snacks? Yeah, fruit snacks. All right, we're gonna get back on the road now. You excited to drive a couple more hours? So looking here, the car is at 85% and closing out that window, it is estimating that we'll arrive at our home or close to it at about 10%. So we're gonna get started as it's getting dark outside. The drive to the Wendover Supercharger took two hours and nine minutes to drive 156 miles, which used 75% of our battery or 59 kilowatt hours. The charge took 55 minutes to add 62% to the battery or 46 kilowatt hours, which if we didn't have free supercharging would have cost us $13. We then drove another hour and 52 minutes to get home 153 miles away, which used 76% of our battery or 59 kilowatt hours. We arrived home with 9% remaining and charged it up 71%, stopping at 80%, which took 6 hours and 12 minutes and finished at 4.22 am. The entire trip, including all driving around while there, was 673 miles and used 256.3 kilowatt hours. The supercharging cost would have been $26 total and the rest of the charging would have cost $15.63 at 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Lydia's awake. We just got home. Are you excited to go to bed? Yeah, she's been asleep. And Lucy here is still asleep. And Clara is still asleep, so we're going to go to bed now. The next day I took the car through a much needed car wash and I had to do some manual cleaning in the inner fender where there was quite the buildup of cow dung. The inside of the car is always in need of vacuuming after road trips and this one was certainly no exception. I asked Discount Tire and they said the plug should work just fine and there was no need for them to do anything under warranty. The tires ended up lasting another 7,351 miles after that patch. When I did replace them it was due to yet another flat tire on a gravel road that I plugged on a camping trip where a series of unfortunate events occurred which I'll be covering in a future video. Electric vehicles are heavy and the thinner the tread the more prone they are to getting punctured. This is what the plug looks like now seven months later. It hasn't been touched we've just been driving like usual and the tires down to 430 seconds and so you can see that plug has been worn down flush with the tread but it still works just fine and there is absolutely no air leakage whatsoever that was a really fun trip i'm really glad we were able to go and ride horses and four wheelers and visit with family and have a good time on the ranch and i hope you enjoyed watching see you in the next video